Hello everybody and welcome to the Human Echoes recap for Game of Thrones Season 6 Episode 8. This one is called No One. And I am Tony Southcott. And I am Albert Berg. And before we get into the episode, we have a little bit of something from the previous episode to address, Tony. We had a listener send us some very correct and very irate uh, texts about our uh, factual problems in the last episode. We kept referring to Elena as Marjorie's mother. Turns out that's not the case. Yeah, it's her grandma. Does she have a mom, Tony? I'm sure she has a mom. I mean, like in the whole... Are you sure? She maybe. was probably born to one. I don't know if maybe their mom not. is still maybe. around. There's magic in this world, Tony. <laughs> you don't know. No, I'm, I'm sure she is. She came I, I, from I, an egg. But uh, Elena is Marjorie's grandmother, which I legit was like, wait a minute. For real? <laughs> which shows you exactly how much we know about Game of Thrones. Because I forgot that, that there was a, a gap there. So apologies to those of you who are much more astute than us uh, noticing that and being annoyed with us getting it wrong over and over we do try to do that do our best but we ain't perfect and with that said let's move on to today's episode yes new mistakes going forward uh, <laughs> starting off back with aria where we left her off in uh bravos she has found help which uh we, we kind of start off in the perspective of this scene that we've seen done before with this one actress uh, in the traveling acting troupe. Yeah, uh, Lady Crane. Doing the death scene. Yes. And she's good. Like, you can see why everybody likes her and why the other girl wants her dead. Is You know, she, like, l delivers a legit death speech that really kind of makes you feel, like, more sympathy for Cersei than Cersei ever does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's not exactly and... instilling sympathy in this episode either. No, she go and, and she gets done and she goes backstage and hears something and finds Arya sort of passed out on the bed, or almost passed out. She's bleeding. And that's maybe the most obvious place she could have gone. I mean, not to jump too far ahead, but the fact that it takes the waif any time at all to find her when she knows, like, two people in Ravos and one of them is this lady... And the other one is obviously back at the House of the Many-Faced God, and she's not going there, so at least not until the end. Um, it, it, it's just a little bit insulting to my intelligence that she didn't go there immediately. Oh, I, the way I thought of it is that she was just toying with Arya anyway. I th She's some combination of a cat and the Terminator from Terminator 3, the, the Lady Terminator. Like she's just she's weird. There's something <laughs> wrong with the waif. I've come to the conclusion in this episode that the whole, like, you're no one thing is complete BS. Yeah, it definitely seems to be, and we'll get to that uh, more towards the end of the episode. But she does, she gets her help to help her nurse her back to health a little bit. There's a kind of a fun little back and forth about how she, <laughs> this woman liked to stab her boyfriends <laughs> for sleeping with other women and then patch them back up. Which is a great sort of, I mean, if you're going to have a hand wave for why she's good at patching people up, <laughs> that's maybe the best version of that. Yeah, it's sort not of like, like oh, yeah. oh, I was a handmaiden during such and such war, and I had to sew people up all the time. It's like, no, I had a bad temper, and I hung out with brigands, and I would stab them and eventually fix them up. It was so classic, and such a, again, it's, it's, it's a hand wave, but it was wonderful to see that. Um... And then, speaking of things that are wonderful to see, we cut to uh, some th some of the guys who had overrun the Hound's uh, little piece of paradise there in the previous episode. There, this scene was, I mean, it's just the Hound killing people, but again, they put that great Game of Thrones spin on it. We get to spend, I mean, it's not a long time. It's maybe like a minute 30 with these guys oh, you get setting like, up. You get full-on lessons about life and kissing and all sorts of things. Well, Checking yeah, the and, oil, and ringing the bell, you know? I definitely, I, I, I can attest that that particular advice... No, I'm just kidding. I've never <laughs> tried that. I would get, I would get slapped across the face. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it's sort of... It's interesting that they give you this perspective. It's like, hey, these are guys. They have their own story. They had their own life. They're, you know, as bad as they are, they hung out and they did their own thing for all this time. And then some dude walked up and killed them and they deserve to be killed. But <laughs> with an axe to it, the it nuts was... and heads flying and all sorts of fun things happening. Complete decapitation. That one guy, you, they, there's several moments in this episode where the victim is in focus and then whoever's coming to kill them is in the background. And this is one of them where 
that you know they go through their whole little spiel and that one guy you know just kind of like is standing there and you just see the hound in the background walking towards him and here he is whop head gone <laughs> <laughs> and that's that that's all there was to that scene but again th- there was that touch and i like that i like that they give you context it's not just he shows up it's not even just from his perspective but it's from their perspective and that what that's what makes that work we already know his perspective but showing it from a little bit of a different angle is what game of thrones does really well yeah just that that little bit extra cuz i mean it would have still been an okay and semi effective scene if it was 30 seconds long and he just walked in and chopped people up but at least we like we're we're going to remember it now yeah yeah, we got gonna remember it. That's the point. That's the thing too. Like, you, they give you those little bits where you're like, "Well, I mean, there's lots of violence in Game of Thrones, but so far we haven't had that much, you know, guys putting their fingers up other guys' butts <laughs> to make a point about how to be a good kisser. Like, th- that will stick in your mind." Yeah. <laughs> next, next we have Tyrion and Varys saying goodbye to each other. Varys going off to enact some plan. And there's not much to this scene, Tony. I, I didn't feel like that there was a lot of meat here. Yeah, it was, it was like meant to show that the plan where they're trying to make Daenerys the Azura High, like, that that's being enacted out. That the Red Priests are talking, and then you have just a little bit of a, hey, I'm going back to Westeros type thing for Varys. But the part in this scene that really worked for me was Tyrion's delivery there. Where he's he's saying goodbye to Varys, and you can you get that like, this is his equal and his only equal in the whole city, the only guy that he can just talk to and be like, yeah, we're we're like we're on the same level, and we find we kind of echo that later on. But as he says goodbye to Varys, as he says to him, you know, hey, Varys says you're the most famous dwarf in this whole city, and Tyrion's like. He delivers that line. He says, no, I'm the whole most famous dwarf in the world. But he doesn't deliver it with that glib Tyrion, like, snarkiness. He delivers it like, I am going to miss you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, part of me was wondering, like, at this moment, Peter Dinklage might be the most famous dwarf in the world right now. Other than maybe, I also like, thought Chadwick of that. Davis. Yeah, that, that's... That's tricky, but I mean, he's close. If if you had a famous dwarves contest, he would definitely be in the top ten. I feel. Yeah, probably. The, it's like, him, Deep Roy, and you know who else? I uh, who was the guy from Jackass? I can't remember his name. That probably disqualifies. Well, he him must from not be the anyway. most famous in the world, then, Tony. <laughs> Uh, th- there, there, that goes out the window. Yeah. Uh, we, we move up to the Red Keep in the next scene with Cersei versus the Faith, Faith Militant. This is the, the moment that they've pulled in the trailers and they also showed it, I mean, it was in, it the, in the season trailer. Yeah, the season trailer. This is when people are like, oh no, so it's like shit's going down. And it's, even though we knew it was coming, this is one, another one of those things. They keep doing these great bits where something you know is coming still plays out in a way that's really powerful and fresh. And Cersei faces off against the face, Faith Militant, and they have that line where they say, you know, they're going to take her to see uh, the High Septon, and she's like, nuh-uh, ain't doing yeah, that. he can come here. Which, <laughs> he's, not, he, he, he's not coming there any more than she's going there. Like, they both understand that, like, once they step into the other person's turf, they're probably hamburger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And they have that moment, right, where the guy's like, you know, please come with us or there'll be violence. And you know she's going to say, I choose violence. Like, you know it. They, they've told, they told you last episode at the end of the thing. They told you in the beginning of the season she was going to say it. And yet there was that, like, back and forth shot as she's thinking and they're waiting. And she says, and just so quietly, after she's thought about it, she's like, I choose violence. <laughs> and, ah, oh, it just, it, it worked in that moment. That That's what movies and TV shows I don't don't get right so many times. You know, they talk about how they, oh, well, they showed us all these moments in the trailer. And moments in the trailer, out of context, aren't necessarily such a bad thing. I, knowing that that coming, was coming didn't diminish my enjoyment. Maybe. I mean, maybe if I had been like, oh, I didn't know that was happening. It would have been extra double good. But to have that, you know, even knowing it was coming, it was still amazing. And then the fight where the guy, the one guy comes up to the mountain and just tries to, 
<laughs> that, that, by the way, the thing he hits him with does not look like a fun, fun thing to get hit yeah, with. Yeah, that, like, that's exactly why they're using that, is because it can go through plate armor, so they can, like, stab inward. It's why people used to use warhammers a lot instead of, uh, instead of just swords, because a lot of times you had to really work to get a sword through a breastplate. And yeah, Also, you could really tenderize some meat with that Yeah, thing. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes, like, in a little bit, and the mountain just... Uh, I'm trying to think of exactly how it went down. I know that you th- you see him throw him down, you see him grab him by the chin, and then you get the full-on, absolute head-ripping-off moment that you knew the mountain was capable of. Like, the mythic hero-type head-rip-off. You'd expect, like, Hercules to be able to be like, and then he ripped the man's head off, like, that sort of thing. Like, from old-timey stories. It's just, it's a different thing to see Robert Strong grab the guy under the chin and then just rip and the faith militants are not unmoved by yes. this either. They're not like, oh, well. They're like, oh, crap. Yeah. Um, Guys, let's go back to where God is in the sept and leave <laughs> this crazy person alone. Hopefully it'll be okay. Yeah, it's the first time we've seen them lose anything this season. Like, it was... Yeah, well, and they didn't even really lose. I, I mean, coming up to what we know is going mean, to... Coming forward in the episode, th- th- it was a... You know, it's like losing a pawn yeah. in a game of chess. It, it, well, I'm just saying, as far was, as a battle goes, this is the first minor setback that the Sept has had, because everything has gone their way. Well, and as a story, t- knowing what comes later, knowing that she's a, she's going to have this huge setback, it's actually really important to have this as a storytelling bit, even because if you think about it, this doesn't serve much of a purpose as far as moving the plot along, right? Because... We know what's going to happen later on. We know that Tillman's going to abolish trial by combat, and that's going to be a blow to her. Th- this, her not pull- going to the Sept right now doesn't really make a difference. They could have just said, well, hey, you stay in the Red Keep. But setting her up with a win here really makes that loss later on hit that much harder. Yeah, it ju- she used her hand too soon. It's like, were they planning to remove the trial by combat all along? Or was this the catalyst that made that proclamation happen? I really think they were planning on it all along. I, this the the Septon is not an idiot. The uh, the High Sparrow he knows about Robert Strong. I'm sure he knows that she's planning to do this. So and possibly while they're talking, maybe he's got the King in the Sept being like, "All right, your mom's over there. She's probably not going to show up." And, and maybe saying to her him also or possibly even using that as leverage we don't see that happen but it's exactly the kind of thing i could imagine where he says to tillman like look we sent some people in there tried to you know do it peacefully and she's using robert strong against us you know that there's nobody who can take him in trial by combat and that's not what god wants i i don't know that that's how that went down and it doesn't need to go down like that but it's just it's a really clever you know bit of storytelling again even though it doesn't move the plot forward to have that set up and then reversal within the episode makes that reversal feel all the more powerful. Yeah, definitely. And the next scene we are rolling into is with Brienne and Pod at the Lannister camp at River Run. Right, and we get a few little bits of dialogue between Brienne and Pod, which is just, he's just adorable. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, And he kind of meets up with, uh, with them and we switch switch over to Pod and Braum, which might have been the most fun part of this scene for sure. Definitely, <laughs> maybe of the episode. Uh, although, yeah, I depending think on the, your bloodied taste, because there were a few good <laughs> the moments. The Hound might win that yeah. one in his final scene. <laughs> but uh, if you're looking you know, for good natured fun, <laughs> Braun trying to teach Pod how to fight sneaks up on him, makes some very crude jokes about Brienne. Uh, <laughs> brings up the fact that Pod has a magic penis, <laughs> which uh, is a holdover from, what, season two? Some, or maybe I three? think it was three, but somewhere in that range. <laughs> Way back then when he he went into the brothel and the women didn't, like, I th- uh, didn't make him pay? Yeah, I think it was uh, season three because it was after Blackwater and they were rewarding him. Something like such that. A great, <laughs> su- such a great little callback. I would like... I'll, this is one of those pair-ups, you know, there's Game of Thrones has these great characters, and you mash them get together in ways that you're not really expecting. I think Braun and Pod have been on the screen before, I think. Yeah, they have been. But definitely, like, at this point, I'm like, well, now I kind of want to see them go off on their adventure. And we know they're not, <laughs> because I, mean, I know how this episode ends. But him 
I, I really do want Pod to learn to fight a little bit dirty because he's learning he's learning all this stuff about nobility and you know doing the right thing from Brienne. But Brienne is also like seven feet tall, and it's easier to be noble and do the right thing when you're seven feet tall. Maybe <laughs> if you're Pod, you kick some people in the nuts occasionally. Yeah, I mean the way uh, Bron even introduces himself is pretty. It, it just goes into how well or how much he needs to learn that he just immediately goes up and chokes him from behind. And then he, like, he starts talking about his stance. He gets him to look down, and then he slaps him upside the head. Everybody wants to hit you. Assume that everybody wants to hit you because they do. <laughs> everybody wants to hit a squire. Uh, the meat of the scene, though, is Jamie and Brienne talking about sort of where they stand. Jamie, and, and I, th- I didn't realize this is where this was going. I, I actually really like the, the idea that Brienne has in mind here, where she says, "Listen, you want them out of the castle. I want them out of the castle." Technically, we're on different sides here, but I let me go in there and try to convince them to come with me. I need these troops. You can agree to let them out. Uh, you'll get the castle. I'll get the troops. We'll go. You know, we'll ride north, and I'll help out Sansa, and you get the castle, and everybody wins. And Jamie's like, "Okay, yeah, sure, go on in there. If you can and do it. If you can do it. Did you? We don't get to see." in this episode, whether he would have kept his word to her yet. Um, I think he's concerned enough with his honor in some ways, especially when it's that public that he would have let them go. You think? I think so. We also didn't get to see because he comes up with a different gambit. We don't get to see her have to carry through with her thing, which she says to him, like, listen, I'm pledged to the other side. So I would have to fight you if you attack. And he's like, yeah, okay. Okay. I know. <laughs> I, I love his react. Uh, he says, of course you would, but he's just like, he, he sort of admires her honor, but he also thinks it's silly and, you know, just wants her to, to chill out a little bit. He, he she's never going to, but he, he's, he can't accept, he, he can't accept the level of responsibility that she has. Yeah. And that's why he wouldn't take Oathbreaker back whenever uh, she tried to give it to him, which was what made me wonder like, okay, I mean, she's giving him, it's called no oath keeper. Oath keeper, yes. Sorry. Right. It's called oath keeper. He's making an oath to her. If he won't take the sword back, called oath keeper. Does that mean that he's not good for his word? But as I mean, we don't see him slaughtering the guys inside the fort at the end of the episode. Yeah, but he also said that he would never bring forces against a Tully army again. Like he made that oath. Did he? Yeah. Back to back in season four or something like that on their trip, like the trip that they made together. Well, I forgot about that. But, I mean, he's his greater good, his ultimate thing that he believes in is is not honor, it's in Cersei. And he talks about that later on in another scene. We'll get into that deeper uh, in that scene, because next we have Brienne going into the castle, talking to the Black, Blackfish, completely striking out. Does not get anywhere, yeah, trying to get those troops. He's definitely a stubborn old man, but you definitely see his perspective, too. Like, he's being asked to just leave the place that he's... His homeland, even. Like, the castle he grew up in. Yes, but on the other hand, every... he He's arguing from the point of view of, I'm old and I don't care if I die. That's but true. there's a lot of other people who will die if this goes down badly. And, and as we see later on, Edmure is from a different perspective. Entire, and, and Jamie calls him out on it even. When he's talking to Edmure, he's like, listen, this guy doesn't, it, like, life does not have the same value to him as everybody else. He doesn't have any family left, really. He doesn't, you know, his life is almost gone anyway. And he just, he's just being stubborn for the sake of being stubborn. I can see his point of view. I'm not saying that he's completely, you know, off his rocker. But he could do a lot of good here. He could make the decision that Brienne knows is in everybody's best interest, in his best interest. And, like, whenever she actually gets him to read the note, he starts seeing how much like uh, Catelyn Sansa is. And that almost moves him, but not quite. It's just a bummer. I mean, even to the point later on where, uh, well, you know what, I don't want to get too far ahead i'd like to keep going sequentially because again we got to go out of order then i skip scenes <laughs> um although speaking of things going out of order we did discuss this next scene a little bit ahead but we're uh, back at the Cersei, red keep yes well i, I think she's in the throne room yeah um 
I don't think that's part of the Red Keep, although I don't know exactly what the geography is I mean, there. if you have a keep, you'd have the throne room inside the keep, right? Well, the keep is just a tower, isn't it? I thought the keep was like the entire castle grounds. You know what? I have no idea, and I'm not going to say things that I don't know about, because <laughs> we've already proved our ignorance well, on this. They are uh, in King's Landing and the throne room. Whether or not that's in the Red Keep, we don't know. And she did not get an invite to this shindig. Nope. Like, there's clearly something going down. I, again, All the they, lords they and ladies show up. It's great that they don't, you know, there's obviously some connective tissue here that they don't tell us about. She's just there, and she's like, why didn't they get an invite? Like, we don't have to see her get the message about, like, hey, they're doing something in the castle. What is it? I don't know. Didn't you get the invite? Um... She knows bad stuff is about to happen. The king's... I think it's the new hand. Yeah, which is, or, uh, is Tywin's brother. Okay. And he says to her, like, listen, you're gonna not go talk to the king right now. And that's, like, if she was not already having alarm bells go off, that's for sure. Big time alarm bells. And the king does, as, as we mentioned, there's that reversal of fortune for her because he says, listen, trial by combat? Turns out maybe not a great idea, it's which... Antiquated and corrupted <laughs> system. Is for, is for real the truth. Uh, it's interesting to see that kind of coming out in Game of Thrones where they're talking about, well, they, you know, everything's antiquated and corrupt. <laughs> it, it was kind of interesting. I was driving home the other day thinking like, man, if you just had really good duelists, you could do anything you wanted and always get off scot-free. Not if God didn't want you to, Tony. Well, that depends on if, like, the gods are really pulling the strings in every battle that's ever happened between kings and men. Well, the that that's the that's the idea the of the faith. Idea. But if if you don't believe that, then you maybe aren't worshiping the gods, right? Well, I'm just saying, if a king didn't care about the gods and had a really good duelist and like just was able to do anything he wanted, well, they're they're they won't be able to do that anymore. Which a lot of people on the forums I was looking at right after the show were like super disappointed. Clegane Bowl canceled. <laughs> Hype diminished. Whatever, Clegane Bowl is just postponed. Clegane Bowl is timeless. Yeah. All right, there's... <laughs> they wouldn't bring him be. back to not give him that fight. I don't think it's going to be this season anymore, though, Tony. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about that as well. Like, it seemed like the perfect uh, season 10 thing, but we'll get to reasons why later. Yeah, so so we'll... We, there, that's still on the table. It's just a little farther away on the table than maybe we would like. <sighs> I have to wait a year. A whole year. <laughs> well, we got some good stuff coming next episode. Yeah. We'll talk about that when we get to there. Um, we, we're back, we end up back in Marine uh, with Tyrion, Grey Worm, and Missande. Not a lot here going on. Like This scene, even the joke, I, I like that Grey Worm kind of won the scene in a sense. He, <laughs> he says, I make joke. <laughs> Where, it it felt gets, like, I don't want to say it was filler, I guess I could say it was filler, but it was it was one of those things showing where Tyrion is, especially with Varys gone, where he's just a little out of his element. He just wants to be around people that want to drink with him, want to rule the city, and they're just they have no humor. It's it's definitely driving that nail home a little further. I I like the character stuff. I do. I think that it's it's pretty important. It doesn't drive the plot that far, but it is interesting to be able to see Tyrion here. If that matters later, like if his sort of isolation and need for companionship plays into something in the future, I'm okay with this. But it does, it is just more of the, oh, hey, Tyrion is on his own and he doesn't have any equals here. And You could almost also, say that it's like what happened before the Hound came into that first scene. Because you've, like, you've got that little bit of flavor and then all of a sudden, oh no, the slavers are here. Or the masters are here. Which I actually was like, wait, is that really them? Or is that the guys from uh, the, not the North, uh, you know, the, the Greyjoys. The Greyjoys. Yeah, I, that... I had to take a look at that. I was like, did they get so, like, is that Euron sigil? Like, I, I didn't recognize it at first. I do not. Uh, guys, I, I don't know if you have picked up that I'm a little bit of a Game of Thrones casual, but I do not have all the sigils memorized. I have most of them, and I think you would remember the giant Kraken. Like, as soon as you saw that on a banner, you would have been like, oh, Greyjoys. Okay, fair enough. But I don't know the other guy's sigil, and I didn't think to eliminate by thinking about the Kraken, okay? It's a little bit late on a Sunday. <laughs> I've, I've got had most of this monster, low-carb monster energy drink uh, to help my brain. But 
I, I didn't make the connection, but they do have those ships in the harbor, and uh, they, they, even that bit, I mean, we'll, we'll go ahead and sort of skip ahead with that, because they do end up bombarding the city, and there's, you know, the fire raining down, and they're like, well, we can only defend the keep, you know, Kieran kind of gets put in his place by Grey Worm, and the fact that, like, hey, why'd you make a deal with these guys? All of this really kind of rubs me the wrong way. N not just, I, I mean, I could accept the stuff, the character stuff, but the fact that Tyrion's getting completely shut down with what he tried to do, right? Yeah. Like, he was trying to work, work this deal out. It seemed like a good idea. Oh, it it's like it's idea Westerosi politics, not like, a, what is it, Esos? I think so. Um, and so he gets, you know, they they it comes back to haunt him, and then Danny has to come in and save the day. Like, what... What purpose did that serve? It, I guess just to, you know, spinning our wheels waiting for her to get back. But that's one of those sort of big plot loops that didn't get us anywhere except to in trouble. Yeah, now she's ah. got, like, the only thing it could serve is that with her dragon, she could just wipe out all the ships and basically be completely in charge of that region. Yeah, I wasn't 100% sure why she didn't just do that. I think that's probably like, coming, probably more like episode 10, because usually episode 9 is pretty well focused. But we did skip over the entire scene with Edmer and Jamie. No, that's next. Well, I mean, we didn't skip over it. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm getting there, Tony. I just wanted, because there's not much more of the Marine that's stuff. That's true. And they tacked it on in a separate scene, and I was like, you know what? Let's just get there. Tadaris gets back. You hear the dragon land on the roof. Everybody kneels. It's time to see Khaleesi, like, kill a bunch of fools with fire. But yes, you are right. Jamie and Edmure have... One of, I think maybe one of the best scenes of this episode as far as like people talking um, and, and drama, you know, like character stuff, because Edmure and Jamie, they're, they're two very different people. And they, Edmure brings up something that's sort of at the heart of the Game of Thrones idea, uh, you know, the, the theme of the whole show about, he asked Jamie, what, what is it that you tell yourself so that you can believe you're a good person because everybody does believe that. And that's really, I think, again, the core of what Game of Thrones teaches and talks about is that there aren't, there are some quote unquote evil people, but everybody in this world has some justification for themselves. They, they all see themselves as the hero of their own story. And we talked about this a little bit last week where you kind of split between, you know, having people talk about how terrible it was that somebody, you know, this this one family did something to them, and you're like, yeah, that sucks, and then you cut back to the, that family doing something and being like, man, I hope they get their, their act together, and hope hope everything's okay with them. <laughs> because everybody is the hero of their own story, and all of these people are sort of individually... Uh, I'm spinning my wheels. Uh, they, they all matter to themselves. I'm sorry, I lost the train of thought as I was speaking. I was just in the middle of a sentence and my brain was like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> no, you, you pretty much had it nailed that uh, <laughs> with Edmure, with uh, Jamie, like he starts talking about like you're talking about oaths whenever you're the Kingslayer, you're talking about all this other stuff and really you, you don't care about the realm, you don't care about people you claim to care about love but you don't even really care about that. Like You're just making justifications at this point because you are a terrible person. And then you see Jamie ramp it up a notch, and he starts threatening some pretty terrible things to Edmure. Well, it also it's it's not just him like getting pissed that Edmure is being saying mean things to him. He's also sort of answering the charge, right? He's saying like, "You say I don't care about anything. You say, you know what I tell myself, the thing that matters to me, the thing that that I that makes me a quote unquote good person in my own eyes is that I love my sister." And I will do whatever. That's my hero thing. That's the that's the 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 center of my being, right? For some people, it's keeping oaths. For some people, it's taking taking care of their children. And for him, it's his sister. And as weird and messed up as that is, it's also his moral center, that the center that grounds him. And he, you know, says to Edmir, he's like, "Listen, I will do whatever, whatever it takes to get back to her." Including, you know, launching your baby son over the wall of the castle in a catapult. And he's still he's still making that same point kind of that Brienne is making. He's like, listen, nobody has to get killed here. Yeah. 
All they have to do is open the gates. All I want to do is go home. We, you don't lose anything. You can go back and, I, I assume he would probably even let him be the lord of the castle, right? If yeah, he's, like, uh, I, bending the knee. He, all those people in there are, i uh, for Lord Tully, and you got to remember, Edmure is married to one of the Frey's son or daughters, so it's like he has right to that castle, even if it is in the name of the Frey's. Like he's still master of that particular castle. Yeah, and so he convinces you know Edmure to go in, and 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 you understand where Edmure is coming from. He's been beaten down. He's been kept in the, the dungeon all this time by you know creepy Frey, which. I look really looking forward. I don't think it's going to happen this season because I don't really see how a, a, any thread is going to let lead that way. Unless Jamie just stops by and says, Oh, by the way, stab. Um, but I really do want to see him get his yeah. at some point. Oh, do you think that would be like over. LSH? I, we can talk about that in the scene with the hound, but that is seeming a little bit less likely now. Yeah. Um, but Edmure kind of takes Jamie up on the offer. He says, all right, Listen, you know, I believe I, I don't necessarily trust you. You know, he, he's one of those guys who wants to call, talk about him, you know, his king slaying days, but he also understands that so a promise of maybe I get to live is maybe he worth- gets to see his son again. His son doesn't get launched over Capitol Wall or Castle right. Wall. He he believes that he definitely will do that, and he <laughs> might let him live if he does. You know, if he goes and surrenders, so he takes the sort of you know, better part of Valor, and, uh, or is that the better part? Which one's the better part of Valor? I think... Caution? I think it's caution. It's it's actually kind of a mix of surrendering to what your enemy wants, but also gaining a lot more for yourself. So it's it's just a smart move on his part, even though it is going to betray his uncle. Like, you go to the top of the wall after this point, and you see, uh, you see Blackfish talking to various people in the, in the castle, and... They decide to go against him just because Edmure is like the by lineage, like they have to follow him, like he has priority. That was really great too to see that loyalty. I I don't know. There's something about that, and we've seen it in Game of Thrones before, like from Brienne and everything. But those guys are like, I don't I don't care if this is a trap. I don't care if he's under you know the Lannister control. He's the boss. Yeah. Okay. This these are the rules. I've been taught to follow these rules, and maybe I'm gonna get screwed over, but I'm gonna do what I'm supposed to do. Well, it's a it's a pretty rough spot because if it's a trap, they know that all of them are gonna that all of them are going to die. If it's not a trap, then there's a chance that they'll have peace going into winter, and that's like their only chance of survival. Because if they go through years of provisions because of a Lannister siege over something that Blackfish wants, then they're kind of screwed either way. Yeah, and so Blackfish, and I was surprised he didn't run. I thought for sure, like, he would be willing to, you know, to try to get out of there. He doesn't. Um, he does help Brienne and Pod get out of there uh, and, and fights to the death. Another off-screen death, which this one I understand. By the way, I, I, I am coming to grips with the idea that Stannis is actually dead, but holy crap, why was that an off-screen moment? Yeah. Like, I don't... It, I don't get Blackfish that. makes a little more sense because it's an old man. Like he's not even that essential to what's happening in the plot anymore. You're killing him off. Like it, it's not going to be a big dramatic thing. But you had Stannis on screen for multiple seasons, like trying to do his thing, and then just all of a sudden being gone. Also, from a budgetary standpoint, like you know, you have to choreograph that fight scene, right? If he's going to have his last stand, you don't want to make it be dumb. So you would have to spend a lot of money. With Stannis, it's just like, well, let's do you know that head off effect that we've done eight thousand times already in Game of Thrones, and then cut to from there. But no, we didn't get that. And I read somewhere that they said something like, oh well, you know, we didn't. We thought it would be gratuitous. I since when is that a thing in Game <laughs> of Thrones? That you're like, you know what? Let's have some restraint here. That's not, we're not watching restraint. Okay, I don't. That's not why I tune in. I don't tune in for restraint, especially for top tier characters. For yeah, for real. Anyway, I, it just bugs me. It bugs me a little bit. It, it feels inconsistent. And like I said, I'm coming to terms with the fact that maybe he's he's actually dead. And I was, a couple episodes back, somebody was commenting, be like, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. Why do you keep talking about it? Because it doesn't feel right for Game of Thrones to kill a main character off screen. And like show, like lead up to it, you know? It, it just uh, weirds me out. Yeah. Weirds me out. The only th- reason why I thought it was legit is because she had him so dead to rights. Well, right, and because she said so later on, if she says she's not, 
Brienne don't lie. Yeah. Uh, it, well, I mean, I don't think say, I'm not gonna say never, but I couldn't. I, can't I mean, what else was she gonna she do? Would. Like, you have to go and take the black. That's your only path to redemption. Yeah, and if he had, then he would have been there. Yeah, there's just no way it makes any sense if she didn't. I'm just saying it was weird. Yeah, I agree. That, that, we're not reviewing that episode, but I'm just bringing that up at this point because it, you know. Anyway, like I said, you, obviously you don't want to spend the the you know the time choreographing that scene when there's other stuff to spend the budget on. Jamie does get the the notification that he has died and he sees Brienne and Pod getting away. Does not and he has send anybody he, after them. He starts to. I, 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 again, great acting where he just does that thing where he looks to the side. He's like, should I? Yeah, no, I'm not going to call anybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he makes that, that, that call and I, it was neat to see his mind go through that where he's... For one thing, he doesn't feel like he's threatened by her directly. That might come back to bite him. Maybe he will be later on, but uh, she's not fighting directly against him. She's just running off to do her mission, and I don't. I don't think he he, he doesn't want to interfere with that. He doesn't need to interfere with that. Yeah. He's got other fish to fry. And the pain house is kind of allied with the Lannisters as well. So if he kills Pod, that might cause some problems back in King's Landing. I don't think anybody's <laughs> gonna care about. <laughs> Look how the prostitutes are gonna revolt. <laughs> <laughs> you killed Sir Magic Penis. No. <laughs> um. I'm just saying, like, Sir <laughs> Illyn Payne is who took Ned's head, so, like, that family does have some clout. Fair enough. Um, I also forgot to mention, by the way, at the end of uh, Cersei's scene where she hears the news about um, trial by combat being abolished, she has a little aside with her uh, half-maester, I'll call him. Like, yeah, I, I put him as a uh, semi-maester in my notes. <laughs> The mad scientist whose name I've uh, forgotten. That's a name that I actually have trouble with. It starts with a Q. Kyburn. 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 Thank you. Yes. Once you say it, I, I, I know it, Tony. That's how that works. Um, <laughs> he, he, she asks him, hey, did, did you look into that little rumor that I told you about? And he says, oh, yeah, and it's way more than a rumor. <laughs> and his eyes are all lighting up. I, I think there's a lot of speculation that that's probably something to do with the wildfire that the mad king stored under the city that's what the people i watched it with said like my sister and uh, her husband were like oh he's talking about the wildfire so like is cersei really willing to either blow up the septed baylor or blow up the entire city to save herself and i would point to yes i would point it not to save herself but to to like to to collapse the church and no in her mind, get her son back. I think definitely yeah. yes. This is her. She doesn't have anybody but Tolman, right? Yeah, like, Tolman's that, like her last guy. person. She likes Kyburn, but that's more of a useful thing. And the mountain is not really that likable. I'm talking about children, yeah. though. That that is the last of her children. Okay, I I, I thought I might have lost count, but holy crap, she's had uh, she's had a bad time. Yeah. <laughs> hasn't been fun for her and he's gonna die by the way the prophecy said he was gonna die gold shall be their crowns and gold their shrouds T tolman will not last well, for the end of the episode for the end of the series i mean everybody dies i she will see him die <laughs> that's true that's how the prophecy went i'm pretty sure i don't know if it'll be this ep this season but the prophecy said she would see him die and so far that prophecy has been bang on so, no matter what Jamie says. If Tommen dies, who actually has claim to the throne right now? Would it be, like, the guy that's the hand? Because that's... Does it not go to the queen at that point? I or... guess I guess, no, it, I guess it's a no... legit marriage, so it probably would go to the queen. Like, Marjorie would be in charge. Yeah, because when... So when Robert died... Well, no, it was his son. Yeah, Joffrey that's took what, maybe over. That's, that's why I was just trying to figure out the, the lineage there. It's also why it's, in the last episode they were trying to get an air pumped out so quickly. Yeah, if she she might have a bun in the oven at this point. You never know. That that would How does that work? I don't even know how I I mean, let's talk about the stuff I don't know about Game of Thrones. <laughs> and I don't know how it works in like real life if all of a sudden all the heirs are dead if it goes to like the brother like which would well, have been Well, if all the heirs are dead and there's a legit like work, you know, fetus happening. Yeah. Does, I think if there's a the, if there's a son or an heir coming, they would definitely default to that and have the queen regent is what the title would be. I think. Okay. Okay. Well, that that I, I all of this is complete speculation. I don't know how that'll work or when it'll happen, but uh, it definitely. I mean, if if he 
I will be very shocked if he survives the series again because of that prophecy. Yeah. Um, we already mentioned uh, Daenerys coming back. It, a kind of a letdown scene again. I know the the, the special effect with them bo- bombarding the sitting was amazing. Yeah. Like those ships hurling that fire was great, but her just popping back in was like, all right. I mean, of all, I've praised several moments. You know, like, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the. The things that, like the you know uh, her saying I choose violence that we know are coming and like oh man that was great and her showing up was just sort of like yeah I know it was her yeah like I knew she was coming <laughs> and, and that I mean I didn't hate it it wasn't like that was a garbage but it was kind of a garbage scene. yeah it, uh, it what like if you're gonna have her show up just have them like look out over the water and see the ships burning or something that would be a, that would be legit. If they're like just the bombardment stops and they turn out like the the ships are on fire and she just like pops it in the dragon. She's like, "Sup, y'all? I'm back." Yeah, she's just Did screaming and everything. I wonder how far behind the Kalasar is. Like, are we all of a sudden gonna see the Kalasar taking over the Marine? Like, there's a lot of unanswered questions from that scene. What scene was not garbage though was the next one. Uh, the ending. It was a little bit of garbage. There was just like, you know, like a crumpled up paper cup or whatever on the floor. But most of this scene, this chase scene between Arya and the Waif, where Arya wakes up, the Waif has killed uh, her uh, helper lady. Lady again, Crane. Eventually, Lady Crane. Uh, by the way, like, messed her up. Yeah, like, like folded her beginning over of, like a, uh, a stool and all sorts of crazy stuff. It's like the thing at the beginning of It Follows, almost. <laughs> it's just like... It, the, Go watch the first five minutes of It Follows, you guys, and then you'll want to watch the rest of the movie because it's amazing. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry about that. But, like, this was a great chase scene. I, I, I saw some people complaining about the Arya stuff. I don't know what you guys are smoking because yep. her just... The only complaint I had is, like, would she be able to move like that after the injury she sustained? Um, She's been spending, like, two seasons getting toughened up. Yeah. So I'm going to say yes. Just, like, belly wounds, though. I was well, honestly expecting even... it to be that uh, Jockin was uh, wearing her mask. Like, I thought... Oh, really? Yeah, because I thought he was trying to punish the waif. <clears throat> like, uh, or basically see if the waif was honestly following directions, because she had the personality where she was going after her. She made her suffer, which is explicitly against the orders of uh, Jockin. And the way she was walking around town in the open, dropping money, like, it felt like it was Jockin. Like, oh, you mean Arya and Jocka? Jocka and Murray in the Arya yes, mask? Yes, that's what I thought happened in the last episode. That would have been pretty cool, and that would have sort of, like, covered up the why are you so stupid, Arya? Yeah, and he's also, <clears throat> like, died for her in, like, three different forms before. But- so uh, that would be neat, but no, it was just a great sh- chase scene. I... I mean, it, it was there was a lot of e- great ebb and flow, you know, her jumping and and getting I mean, the wounds opening back up, which I thought was a great touch where it's like, oh, yeah, she's actually still really bad. Yeah, hurt. Especially after she tumbles down like 50 steps. The only thing that bothers me a little bit about this, and I mentioned it kind of earlier, is that the waif is taking a lot of enjoyments in in this and we've sort of. They've hammered it over and over and over about how they're supposed to become no one, right? That they're supposed to lose themselves, lose their, you know, their former identity and give themselves it's over to It's supposed to be blind to obedience, God. basically. Right. And she, I mean, I guess she has the obedience down, but she definitely hasn't turned her back on whatever she was. Like, she's take, she's not some... She's hateful. Yeah, she's not uh, this impersonal force of death that the many-faced God is supposed to be. She is... Ang- you know, angry and enjoying and somewhat psychopathic, which, I mean, granted, if you're going to have a cult of people who go around killing people, maybe you do attract that kind of person. But I, it made me wonder, how did she get in? How did she get past Jockin's little, like, you know, tests and lying to each other? What was her entry point that, that, that they were like, okay, you're cool to get in, but not this Arya girl <laughs> who keeps telling us she's no one, but still, like, holds on to her former self, like... Is it just that you don't that you renounce your family and you can have all your other personality traits and be fine? It, th- that just bugged me a lot. Yeah, but I totally called how it was going to happen. You totally did. I I totally took credit for it <laughs> when I was watching with my wife. I was like, oh, I called that. <laughs> but now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure it was you that called it. But I I called it with you, yeah. Tony. 
We call it together. <laughs> that's what we'll say. Um, At least for this. That was awesome. Yeah. Though. Like she pulls needle out. Like she takes the stance of like her old bravosi, like a uh, dancing master and slices the candle. Go to black. And that was a great way to sort of cut. I mean, talking about cutting around big battles, which I know we have a giant battle coming next episode. So you really got to save that money. Although they, again, there's so many great things that we talked about in a previous episode, a previous part of the uh, previous scene, how that you have, you know, the person being chased in focus and then uh, the person in background chasing them out of focus, but you can still see them. And there was so many moments like drama and tension when she's running, when the waif is running along the top of the wall, and Arya's, like, stumbling along. Although that part, again, was sort of like, why? Wait, you could have just jumped on top of her. You had to jump, like, three feet back and make a giant crash? Why? Yeah. But it's... I I, I said I'm not... I'm not I, I still like the scene, Tony. I, I have nitpicks about it, but I thought it worked out really well. I like the tension of it. The only thing, the, the big thing that I didn't like about it was how it ended with her going back to the, you know, the Temple of the Many-Faced God... And talking to Jockin. And I didn't understand what purpose that served. He says, now a girl truly is no one. And it's like, Yeah, but he no. was smiling when he said that. Like, he knew. What? Why? Like, uh, he, I, did, I think it was just more ceremonial with that. Like, I did like that she just straight up carved the face off and brought it for the wall. Yeah, I don't know if she did it right. <laughs> that face probably is going to melt. Yeah, I don't... Or like, rot, I mean. When it, it looked like there was a little bit of a a format to how they got their faces. Like, you know, just, they might need some salts. They might need some other stuff. This was just like a jagged, nasty face cut and put into a socket. And that was cool and all. But again, the, the moment, the final moment between him and her did not ring true. Like that did not feel like the resolution that I wanted to her at least full season that she spent there. No, two seasons now. Yeah. Basically, because she was there for all of the previous seasons. Yeah, she got there at the beginning of last season. She went blind. She did all that other stuff. Like, it, it's basically been a two-season arc for her. And, like, if the if her arc culminates in her literally saying a girl is Arya Stark and, and she is going home, then it seems like it's a little bit of twisting around for something that could have just been glossed over. Yeah, it... Like, they could have shown her getting more and more badass, and then, like, at the end, she just doesn't want to be it and leaves. But, like, the, it just it wound and wound and wound and didn't feel like it was fully resolved perfectly. There was a lot I liked about it, but it just wasn't... It's it's the same thing with Daenerys. Like, she ended up back with, uh, like, the the calls people. Like, she has a Colossar and everything now. She had to go back to go forward, and that was, like, that was also prophesized for her, but... It just feels like a lot of work to get to the same spot that they were in before. Yeah, and there's a lot. There is quite a bit of that in Game of Thrones. I, it, the the wor- even worse thing about it is, I she doesn't seem like she's tougher at this point. Like I felt like she would have learned more about killing people from the Hound than she has from the Many Faced God. She probably did, in all honesty. Like the Hound taught her all sorts of things, especially about fighting bigger people. Yeah, and they had, like, legit chemistry. Like, this was just, again, two seasons of basically misery for yeah. her. She had no friends. And back in she season two, in this... she had a lot more chemistry with Jack and, like, uh, whenever they were at Heron Hall. Right? Yeah, that and that was... And, and we're left with, the you know, the, the waif said to her, Hey, the many-faced god gets what he wants. You know, you give him a name and he gets his name. Does that mean that Jack and has to send somebody after her now? Uh, I, it really depends on if the many face God actually said her name or if it was just like, Oh, well, she failed as a recruit. So we'll just kill her anyway. I, I mean, that doesn't seem like the kind of thing the waif would lie about, yeah. but I have to bring up, I, I missed a scene, Tony. We did a great, great scene. The hound gets his man. He also goes his two men and meets Beric Dendarian, who we haven't seen and for like some three chicken. or four seasons. No, he doesn't eat. Yeah. Chicken, they, sorry. they embrace the meme. He's like, I'd rather have had chicken. <laughs> Not it was it was it wasn't too heavy handed, but it was, it was a slight was nod. But it was fun. all good. It was for sure a like, hey guys, we saw that meme. <laughs> wink, wink. Um, uh, <clears throat> there wasn't a lot of weight to this scene, but it was fun to see the hound like arguing with these people about 
like how many people he gets to kill and how he can kill them. Yeah, they don't want him just like chopping him up. They're all strung up because <laughs> it was really out of character for the uh, Brotherhood Without Banners to be murdering civilians. Like that's their entire calling is to protect civilians and uh, protect people. So, like, I thought it was a little bit awkward at first that they would go in and just kill a bunch of people trying to build their own sept. And, like, they, it looks like the Brotherhood's taking care of justice in their own way. Which, the weird thing is, earlier in the episode, you know, Jamie brings up, when he's talking to Edmure, he brings up Catelyn Stark, right? And I was like, okay this is planting the seed for us, right? This is like him talking about how she would do anything for her kids. That's giving us like a little bit of a nugget to say, Hey, remember Catelyn Stark? And then bam, Lady Stoneheart, right? And now we see the brotherhood without banners and they're clearly not working with a half zombie lady who had her like throat sewed back on. Like that's not happening unless and unless who's the guy who the priest for Beric Dondarrion? I forget. It's uh, like Thoros or something like that. I'm trying to think. Yeah, Thoros of Mir. Right. Maybe they're like keeping it a secret from him, or but that doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like the kind of thing that you just be like, oh, and by the way, on top of wanting you to work with us now, meet our other new ni- sort of half leader, who is also a zombie lady. Yeah. It, 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 I, I'm not saying it can't happen now, but I am, I am more likely to believe after this episode that they were telling the truth when they said no, Lady Stone. Yeah, I kind of am too. Which it's not that they're not embracing the paranormal; it just doesn't seem like it quite fits with the way things have moved for the show. Maybe we'll get her I, next it, season. It could have been a great moment. I mean, at this point, if they didn't bring her back ever, they can't bring her back. Like. It, the, the, the whole idea when she does end up coming back, it's like, well, she wasn't dead for super long and they found her. Well, I mean, she was dead for quite a while, but, you know, they bring her back after like a day and she's still kind of messed up and their throat's all sewn together. And spoilers for those of you who haven't read the book. Yeah, I'm going to be but, uh, putting a lot of spoiler tags at the beginning of this episode for once about 48 minutes rolls around. <laughs> but it's it does feel like we've kind of pop that balloon a little bit and said, you know what? We're not doing that. Um, I, I still have, I, and that's what I think a lot of people were disappointed in this episode, just because it felt like a lot of theories were apparently there was a big theory going around, which I had heard and didn't put a lot of credence in that Aria and the waif were like the same person. Yeah, I'd like heard that Tyler too. Durden kind of but, like th- we were going to find some big reveal that they were actually like, they were the same person the whole time. And it was different aspects of personality. And I was just like, that, didn't ever even cross my mind. I liked your idea better that it was Jockin wearing the Arya mask the whole time. Although it seems like that the masks don't quite work that way. Like it kind of the 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 waif was never anybody who was like way shorter than her. And even when that one lady gets killed, that the person who kills her, has, even though it has a different face, still has the waif's haircut. Yeah, just uh, has a goatee. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. She's just wearing a comedy mustache. It's not even a face. She just has little glasses. With Stealth, nose. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> we're on to the wild speculation and review of the trailer for next week, which this is setting up the Bastard Bowl. Yep. Yeah. I. I mean, there's no way John doesn't win this, right? Most likely. You don't. You don't bring him back at the beginning of the season, have him killed and bring him back from the dead and then be like, oh, we killed him. Psych. You, All this battle that we built up to didn't ma- matter. You do have him telling Davos and the the Red Woman that if he dies, don't bring him back. That's like kind of a hint, but I don't know if that's just put in there to make that like to raise the stakes. Yeah, that's just to make you be like, oh, what if he dies? He's not going to. I mean, he might get bad hurt. Uh, Sansa might die now that I think about yeah, it. Yeah, I could see that. Although, uh, like, there wasn't any sign that she was even at the battle. Well, she's got to be around there somewhere, yeah. right? She's traveling with the army. I, I mean, if the the little fourteen year old, or not even fourteen, like you know, ten year old girl is going, yeah, with Le- her troops. Leanna, like, Sansa's- I didn't even notice that at first, but Leanna was actually traveling with her like sixty two soldiers. <laughs> Hopefully we'll, she'll get more stuff this next episode. Yeah. Do you think we're going to have a... It doesn't seem like there's enough there to have a whole 
episode nine long battle with just them at Winterfell. I think it depends on how crafty they have to get to win. Part of the reason why they were able to do that giant uh, battle up in I. Uh, up in the north whenever the wildlings were taking over is because the numbers were so different and they had to show all the different ways that the wall was prepared to handle a lot of wildlings coming. So just by showing the different traps, the different tactics, the different everything else, they were able to stretch that into an hour. I think that it's going to be a big episode nine thing. I don't know if it'll be as good as hard home considering that hard homes, like my favorite episode ever, but we'll see. The, it, I like hard home a lot. But the weakness of Hard Home is we go like it shows up for that episode and then we're gone. Like there's no stakes for Hard Home. Nobody's up. I mean, people live there, but not anybody that we know. It's just him showing up in a big giant battle. If we have that kind of scale of giant battle with Winterfell at stake, and Tormund with, and everybody that we've built up over these seasons, right? All of these characters that we already love, and again, I I think it was. Who all was at Hardhome besides John? Uh, his friend Ed, and uh, a bunch of cool new wildling characters they introduced to murder, and one Yeah, one. right, so, again, it's sort of like, I mean, Hardhome almost just like, hey, here's a cool little tiny movie that stands on its own, and we introduce new characters, and they get killed off, but if this battle at Winterfell lasts a whole episode, I, it, for me, it could be better than Hardhome. I, and personally... I still think the uh, King's Landing Blackwater uh, battle, Blackwater for me is better than Hard well, because there's so many great moments. Yeah, that with Tyrion and with uh, the Hound and even and like the Podrick cynical nature of Cersei up in the tower with Sansa was pretty good too. Yeah, so again, I'm not trying to diss Hard Home or say that it was a bad episode, but for me, as battle episodes go, while it was beautifully shot and and definitely very cinematic. From a storytelling perspective, even even like the the like you said, the attack on the wall, um, I think you know because that's a place that we've sort of grown attached to, meant more to me than Hard Home did. Hard Home was cool. Uh, not, like not, as from not, a technical not point, I think Hard Home is the best they've done for a battle. Okay, I I will. I'm not arguing. You know, sort of cinematic and computer effects and all that stuff. There's definitely a lot of great effects there. And partly because because there are zombies, but you know, I I think well, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I'm excited for it. It definitely looks like it's going to come down to a one on one fight. You hear Ramsey tell, or you hear John telling Ramsey like, "We don't have to have all these people uh, killed. We can do this like against each other." So I think at some point it might come down to that. That would really, I mean, it could, but no. I'm just saying that's probably how it's going to go down. There will be, I mean, we see the giant, like, horses riding against each other and big forces of men moving. There will be a battle. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, towards the end of it, like, they're going to meet up. You know that it's going to happen. I just hope Davos makes it out because Davos is awesome. I, I'm i pretty sure John's going to make it out. We'll see about the rest. If that is all of Episode 9, I think Episode 10 is probably the trial of Cersei, which is a little bit sort of like, okay, well, we sort of saw that already i mean it's just a repeat of the last season's ending yeah. if she gets well if she ends up being again. like executed that would be a, diff a little bit different well and jamie's you know he did complete his task he's headed back the king told him not to come back yeah, right didn't like, the king say hey sure, you gotta get out pretty sure the king wants them to go to casterly rock after this but if he hears that the trial is coming there's not much that is going to keep him out he's got an entire so, army that's loyal to him as well are they loyal to him more than to the king? That's, uh, I guess not, but I think that they Probably like. Not. I think that he could at least get to King's Landing. He, so, uh, episode ten, I'm saying, Jamie at King's Landing, dealing with in one way or another, Cersei getting, uh, you know, being on trial. Either he rushes in and saves her and gets killed himself, or, uh, but again, how does Tommen end up? Oh, it could end up just being Tommen's thing. Could be. Maybe Marjorie's we scheming the... for that. There's all of that. Um, <laughs> There's so much that's uh, wildfire. Yeah, the wildfire could go up. I think that's more for the season after this. But they did hint at it here, so it's it's really hard to tell what's going on for episode ten without any sort of context from the trailer. So I think that's going to do it for this week. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, if you like this episode, uh, subscribe to our podcast. We have a regular podcast each week where we. Uh, 
do a movie review of a usually of something you probably haven't heard of. Last week we did a North Korean film called Hong Kil Dong, uh, which actually turned out to be much better than you would think a North Korean film would be. And there's a really interesting story behind that. You should check out uh, the Human Echoes podcast if you don't listen to that already. Also, if you're listening to this on YouTube, uh, give it a like and subscribe because uh, that sure helps us out. And uh, you can see all other stuff that we put up there as well. All right. You guys have a good one. Bye, guys. Shoo. Oh, that was, I need to, hold on.